Production day four, Southern California, first of 2023. I'm in Las Flores, California, which is southeastern Orange County. Actually, the project I shot in San Francisco late last year, the editor lives um, just up there. It might actually be in this development. It's either this development or the next one at that tree line. But uh, I'm going to reach out and send him a text and see if he can stop by set today. Today's not a continuation of the other project I'm on. This is actually uh, just lucked out. Uh, picked up a little one day. It's uh, 30 second spots. So we're going to get a few shots interior and exterior of this house. And uh, that's my director in the Tesla. Here up front, director, producer. Kind of a, like an insert day. Um, I don't know. It's like a elements package, maybe we'd call it, for... Um, a spot and then going to be used as library footage for future advertising. Left my phone in the truck for the walkthrough. <clears throat> Wasn't able to record it. So I'm parked here on the hill. I think I'm going to repo. Get Chris with the lighting truck. He's going to pull up to the Tesla's position, which is level ground. I think this is the best angle exterior. All right, set up for my first shots. I'm gonna be fairly simple today. One FX9 on sticks with the Paralynx, and then I've got the slider in there for slider shots, and then director's monitor, seven inch. Look at this, sunny Southern California. Don't fall for the illusion. It was 38 degrees Fahrenheit when I got in my truck this morning and my ears are frozen, my feet are cold, my hands are numb. It's hard to believe I grew up in the north. Now uh, I get down here south and um, it's above freezing and I'm still miserable. Same lighting truck as the music video day, mostly apertures, hard sources, so same concept as the music video, but uh, an entirely different look. This was all about dapple slashes pools of sunlight. I ended up setting up my Hollyland transmitter as a wireless relay off the director's monitor to feed a zoom feed. I do have a second receiver for the Paralynx, but I left it with my lighting gear at the corporate location, which was uh, something we re-zoomed -re on the following day. This is my third production for a fellow filmmaker, Rob, who is also my first client that I picked up off uh, this YouTube channel way back at the beginning of 2020. When I started vlogging, I was genuinely doing this as kind of a service to give back to younger people starting up uh, the freelance life. I had no intentions to market and uh, pick up new business, but that's been a nice little result of putting all this content together. So thank you, Rob. I'm very appreciative of the work. A few other bookings have come in from fellow filmmakers via the vlog. I had a shoot where I was covering for another DP's client on a shoot here in San Antonio. And then about six months later, one of my clients had a shoot in their market and I was double booked and couldn't travel. So I was able to reciprocate and send it back in their direction. So just super satisfying process and all the more motivation to continue vlogging. So thank you all for this great community. Kind of interesting watching the lighting technology evolve. You know, we've gone from hot lights to fluorescence to now LEDs and the the looks and creative now have kind of gone full circle it's very similar to the type of work i was seeing in the 90s when i was in high school i actually started thinking in the early 90s about 1992 sort of before kino flows were super prevalent you had uh halogen tungsten lights and we we're doing a lot with fresnel lenses and cutting slashes and pools and then you'd clip diffusion gels on barn doors or in frames in front of to soften edges. And that's kind of exactly what we're doing now with the apertures. Talking with Chris, the gaffer on this show, and he and I have had this conversation many times that it was kind of boring for a while there. Like everything went Kino flow in the mid-range production world, like Kino soft everything. And then from Kino to sky panels, just a continuation of like lots of soft, shadowless, diffused light, flat lighting, kind of boring and uninspiring for uh, the creatives on crew. And so now having these uh, chip on board LED instruments is bringing us right back to the old days with hot lights where we got to cut 
and shape. Um, but I will say it's still not quite there. The chip on board, it's a bigger light source. So when you cut, you can't get a nice clean defined edge like you can with a traditional halogen light, Fresnel lens halogen and barn doors. I'm hopeful in the coming years we'll start seeing LED, single light source LED bulbs that are point source like the old halogen days. And of course, without all the heat, I was thinking about this commercial in particular, you know, we had uh, what, uh, three aperture 300s, a 600. I don't think we got into the 1200. We did use the 600 for one shot, but uh, a number of years ago, working in Southern California, shooting spots very similar to this one, this would have been right on the edge of probably having a generator and, you know, predating M18s. So like we may have had like uh, one 4K HMI and then a couple of 1200s, and then a tungsten cart package, uh, all of which was just a little bit too much to run off of residential power. Or this might have fallen right under that kind of budget threshold for that. And in that case, we would have been like unplugging the washing machine, the dryer, the garbage disposer, all of which tend to have a dedicated circuit in residential houses in Southern California because generally just trying to pull off of the, the wall outlets, you know, rooms share 20 amp circuits and it's just not enough power. So first time using this little MT Pro. Uh, correction, actually we let, the previous week we used this on the music video. We had a, several of these on the floor with color uh, side lighting equipment cases in the background, but we use it as just a little edge ping on our subject. Uh, although I don't think it was doing a whole lot. This was a setup where we had the, the 600 as our primary light source into the wall in the background, Aperture 600D with a cut and then our subject is uh, keyed with a Astra one by panel. Another great instrument that I used to use all the time and kind of fallen out of, out of using. I don't own any currently. So as I continue to self-reflect on uh, my career and 22 years residing in Southern California, these advertising assignments like the traditional 30 second ad were one of the regular rotations of bookings. You know, I uh, initially worked as a lighting technician and later a cam op and ultimately a DP. And for about 15 years working as a DP on these, you know, what I consider mid-range 30 second spots. So anywhere from like a cast and crew of say about eight people on up to about 30. And uh, for me, it got as big as like, you'd have like a five ton grip truck, box truck, and then a, a lighting truck of similar size, and then like three and three or even four and four on grip electric, first AC, and a DIT. Sometimes you'd have a um, video village person just specific for playback and monitors, sound department up to two people, uh, and all of that moving to Texas, I, I've fallen out of the rotation or I just don't have that client base regionally in Texas where in Southern California, I had uh, several agencies and production companies where I wasn't necessarily their main phone call, but I was like in the rotation. I'd be in the roster of uh, you know, between four and eight DPs that they'd cycle through to book projects. And a lot of those companies would have in a given week, uh, two or more productions happening. So it was just like a volume game and I loved it. I, I had a 10 year run with one company in particular shooting direct response. So they were sort of a turnkey product development firm that would get a contract to market a new consumer product. You know, it could be like a vacuum cleaner or like home cooking appliance or uh, like clothing or footwear, hair care, beauty. And ultimately their goal is to get it on the shelves of big box retail. So they start by doing these 30 second direct response ads targeted regionally on traditional broadcast and cable and then um, up to you know, a national buy. And then they would also, that production company would be handling the call center and or the fulfillment warehouse for orders. And the goal of all of that, again, is not really to sell product direct. It was to ultimately get it into the big stores like the Walmarts and, and Targets of the, the world. And yeah, I don't have that in Texas. I, I still get the calls back in California, but I can really only go on the multi-day stuff where production's willing to pick up the cost of travel or it's a bigger budget show where my, my day rate is healthy enough that I can just uh, absorb the cost of travel and lodging. So a question I've received multiple times is people want 
me to talk about my experience in, and opinion on the labor unions in the production world. So NABIT, which is mostly like sports broadcasts and traditional broadcast news, and then IATSE, which is the main entertainment and advertising guild. So in my case, IA would be the, the, the most frequent and Local 600 uh, for me as a cinematographer. And I was always in this threshold, like just below the project scale that would go union. Uh, I would get occasional calls and I actually had a couple, I've had bookings where I'm booked as the DP and then the thing expanded and flipped and went uh, 600 and basically I got replaced. And had I not moved in 2020, I was right to the point. I had, I had one major broadcast company that's IA and they were willing to, I forget the language, basically sponsor me. Like I'd have to pay the initiation fee, but they were my endorsement as opposed to having to go through that work experience um, approval process. I basically had this big entity that's all union and they wanted me to shoot. So that was my ticket into 600. And that was just before the lockdown and everything stopped. So I didn't pursue it. Uh, and then I moved and so now it's not really relevant. And honestly, like I was in my 40s at that point and to go union, there are a couple of problems for me. One, all of that work is in Los Angeles. I lived in South Orange County. I did not want to move back up to LA and uh, like 90 minute to three hour commute each way, uh, three to five days a week on what would become 12 hour production days is just too inhumane, it's not gonna work. And then second, like if I wanted to pick up stakes and relocate to LA to go b do the bigger shows and, and go that direction, uh, I'm too old to really benefit from um, the retirement package and the healthcare. Like I, I don't think, well, who knows, but I, I felt like I wasn't gonna have enough consistent volume on union days to uh, qualify quarterly for the benefits. And I certainly wasn't gonna put in 30 years into the retirement package and I'm kind of out of the loop on that. I don't even know if they're still doing the pension thing. I think it's all switched to like a, a 401k equivalent. All right, back to the day. So this is Chris Phoenix, my gaffer based in Orange County's new ProMaster High Roof. I think we had the, the music video was the second project that was out on. He's still getting it figured out and dialed in. Uh, he went with the 8020 aluminum extruded, uh, the square modular stuff to build the racks, uh, crazy expensive, but uh, very modular and experimental. I've been debating rebuilding the back half of my van in 80-20. Uh, one thing you'll notice with truck packages from people that have been in the business for 15 years or more is they carry a lot less stuff than someone who's five or 10 years in with a truck package. It seems like the, the five or 10 year trade person freelancer is just overloaded. They've got you know every widget on board and then it kind of all vomits onto the sidewalk because you got to move eight things to get to the thing you need. And as you get more experienced, you just learn how to do more with less and you've got your truck organized in such a way that you don't have to move anything to get to anything else. It's one reach to get one thing so Chris carries a 20 by round frame, 10 foot sticks overhead in this rack, uh, square 12 foot frame, uh, so 12 foot sticks, and then an eight by, and I believe a six by. And then he's got some other various length pieces of uh, round speed rail, inch and a quarter, schedule 40 that you're looking at here, which is for menace arms or just random rigs that you need to build that only require a single pipe, like a teaser or a goal post to blackout, say a, a window. And then to the right, there's an upper shelf where he's got full rag sets of eight by 12 by, and then I think he's got like a 20 by black and a 20 by silk. And the overhead shelf forward is furniture pads. Directly below that, I th think that black case is like Manfrotto lighting kit stands. And then the wooden box forward is two shiny board reflectors. And then he's got a combo stand hanger on the shiny board rack. And that black hand truck is a rolling C-stand cart. And then to the right here, apple boxes and forward of the apples in the side door is just stacked milk crates where he moved all his aperture lights and light panels over to milk crates because they can be stacked and rolled around location with a simple hand truck. 
which is pretty smart. Chris is a big fan of milk crates. I've gone through phases where I love milk crates and then I jettison all of them and go back to just equipment on shelves. And then this was pretty smart. He uh, moved the divider back a couple of inches so that you can recline the driver's seat a bit more. I struggle with this in my ProMaster on the long drives. I just can't get enough seat adjustment to change my back angle. All right, 15 minutes of me rambling is enough. I hope you found some of this interesting and we'll continue the discussion down below in the comments. And I've got more coming up in the next video. Thanks for watching.